Welcome to UNESCO's Inclusive Policy Lab. My name is John Crowley. I'm the Chief of Section for Research Policy and Foresight in UNESCO's Sector for Social and Human Sciences. And it's a great pleasure to invite you back to our series of podcasts with leading experts looking at the social policy and social inclusion dimensions of the pandemic and the post-pandemic reset, as the phrase goes. Uh, we want, of course, a reset along a more equitable and inclusive path. Question is, do we know what that would mean? Do we know how to achieve it? And are there any signs that the pandemic has actually pushed at least some of the parameters of debate in the right direction? This has been a great series of podcasts for over the last couple of months with some uh, excellent uh, contributions, and I hope you've been able to enjoy previous episodes in the series. Um, as usual, the conversation today will revolve around two main things. First, the concrete policy measures that our invited experts see as being conducive to such an equitable recovery, assuming there are any. And secondly, the data and the knowledge that could and should inform such policy shifts. Our invited expert today is Robert Walker. Robert is a professor emeritus at the University of Oxford and the former head of Oxford's social policy department. He's currently a professor, professor of social policy and development at the Chinese Institute of Social Management at Beijing Normal University. Among other things, his research interests include the politics of welfare states, poverty, and stigmatization in relation to social policy. And these are the areas of expertise that we'll be building into our discussion today. Robert, welcome. It's a great pleasure to be talking to you today. Thanks. Good to be here with you, John. Thank you very much. So I'd like first to um, talk about universalism as a concept in uh, social policy. And of course, this goes back to some very old literature, the famous uh, book by uh, Esping Anderson on the three worlds of welfare capitalism, for instance. It's not obvious that universalism should be a design principle of social welfare systems or social benefit systems. And indeed, there are many well-known uh, systems that have evolved historically on non-universalistic lines. So there is some indication, at least from informal reports, evidence, um, uh, feedback from public discussion, that the COVID-19 pandemic has brought with it more universal, perhaps more progressive social policy interventions, or at least proposals, across both the global north, as the phrase goes, but also many parts of the global south. Never before have solutions such as universal basic income and various variations on that theme been taken so seriously in policy debates, and indeed, experimented with at such a scale. What, what's your take on this? Do you think that this is indeed the case, that there has been a shift in how people are thinking about the role of universalism in um, social policy and welfare provision? And if so, do you see this um, uh, trend towards the use of various forms of guaranteed minimum income, universal basic income, or whatever, as being a genuine shift, or maybe just a set of improvisations in the face of an emergency? Well, I think those of us involved in policy are always optimistic. We look forward to positive change. So let us hope that that change is indeed uh, a move towards thinking about universalism. And, and certainly when you look at, at what's happening, um, when you look at the way governments have responded, um, it's clear that it is the role of the state to respond in situations of crisis. It's the role of an effective and um, efficient state to do so. And I think there's an important relationship between the effectiveness of the state and the extent to which its population has respect for that state. But it has responded. Maybe it's responded out of fear. We have seen policies going in place which are much less targeted than the past. There are provisions which are going to people in particular circumstances. The breaks have come up expenditure. We need to spend, and therefore we spend first and think about, about the cost later. Um, we see, and with great surprise and, and pleasure, to see that often the benefits are more generous than they were before. We have to ask why. <laughs> Is this because those benefits are going to people who are within the labour market and therefore in some sense are seen as fully functioning citizens? Is it because it's the middle class that are being 
affected this time, and therefore there's a need for, for, for governments to protect the middle class. But, but clearly, we are spending money. We see there's a problem, and we believe the state uh, can respond to that. Um, I think we've also seen that the market can't. It has a role to play. It is the market that has the hope come up with the solution in terms of a vaccine, but only because much of the risk was supported by the state in that, and we have a partnership uh, in place. When we look at the health system, we see that the private sector hasn't been able to cope uh, in circumstances where the private sector is more dominant. And so I think what we've created a bit, unfortunately, the metaphor is with wartime. People have confidence that the state can take meaningful decisions, respond to its population. And I think that therefore begins to lay the foundations for a central state and opens up the possibility of universality. We are not making the distinctions that we have previously made. It's much less conditional. It's, if you like, shifting, shifting more to an, an emphasis on what citizenship brings. Thank you. That's, that's very clear. And the, the reference to war, I find particularly telling, because, of course, as many of the people listening to this podcast will know, there's a lot of literature on the ways in which the two world wars were major drivers of transformations in uh, welfare systems, particularly in Europe, uh, with, as you indicated, a perception uh, both of the collectivization of risk uh, and the necessary role of public authorities in providing against that risk. Um, do you think we have evidence that that shift in understandings of risk, uh, disadvantage and solidarity uh, is something that's really um, reshaping public opinion? Or is it something that, again, is a response to an emergency that's important in policy circles, but might actually evaporate very quickly? Um, the two world wars uh, definitely did produce durable changes in welfare systems. Uh, is there any reason on the basis of evidence we have about what's happened over the last year to think that that might happen again? Or are we just speculating and hoping? Well, there are a few surveys which suggest that that people are more open to the possibility of, for example, um, universal minimum wages, possibly a basic income guarantee. A study was undertaken, I think, in the UK, which suggested that as many as 70 people, 70% 70 of people, felt that, that that would be a way forward. I think what we've also learned um, is that the payment of cash uh, brings substantial benefits to people's lives. Um, it's the cash that makes the difference. And this cash has not been made, certainly not been made conditional, it's not been given in kind. It's a resource that gives people the agency to decide how, how, how to spend that. And it's also important to recognize that social security, cash, it's, it's not really a resource cost. It merely determines who spends the money. Um, um, there's minor costs in terms of administration, but essentially it's, it's a, a determination of who should receive the money and who should have the right to spend it. And that in turn, of course, has repercussions in terms of the fact that we are giving money to individuals is partly to benefit the circumstances of the individuals, but it's also to lubricate the economy. So this distinction between the individual and community has been in some sense contradictory. I think we've woken up once again to the fact that they are intimately connected. And the dissociation with health and the economy, again, we recognize that you need a healthy labor force to run an economy. And it's not a, it's not a zero sum game that we either choose to help individuals or through protecting their health or um, protecting their jobs. They are, uh, they are reciprocal. They are part of a, uh, a, an interrelationship that society uh, needs, to, needs to respond to. Yeah, that's a, that, thank you. That's a very interesting point. Um, I've certainly been struck living in France, listening to public debate in the UK and other countries about the way in which what one could perhaps call the social, social duty to consume uh, 
has become central in uh, policy discourse over the last year, precisely because everyone was so sensitive to the possibility that economies might be wrecked by uh, confinement and other uh, risk mitigation measures directed at the pandemic, as if um, at the policy level, a kind of common sense Keynesianism of aggregate demand management uh, yeah. was reappearing, um, even though the ideology uh, is still an ideology of uh, fiscal responsibility, austerity, and so on. Uh, and even though we've just come out of an extended period of practically a decade, where many countries have been implementing quite severe austerity policies, um, in, in which case, indeed, um, we know that those shifts tend to be durable. And as Keynes himself said, um, policymakers often don't realize the extent that they're simply acting under the dictation of some long dead scribbler, uh, his words. Uh, in this case, the scribblers might not be long dead, but um, the dictation is very real. Yeah. Um, now, moving on from, from that, your research has looked, um, among other things, at uh, issues of shame and stigmatization in social policy, which, as it happens, is something that when I was an academic many, many years ago, I was also uh, very interested in, uh, particularly the question of non-take-up and the social drivers and even anthropological drivers of non-uptake of services. Um, is it your impression that the move towards a kind of universalization of risk combined with new forms of universalism of provision can actually act to uh, counter the shame and stigma built into being the recipient of um, welfare. Is, is th that would clearly be a desirable outcome. Um, it's normatively defensible. Do you see any evidence that this is actually happening? Like you, I would hope one could see glimmers in, in, in that direction. It, it is clear from from our work, that, that, that shame is, and stigma are invidious, that they undermine agency, um, they reduce social capital, they make people much less able to help themselves, and shame is actually painful, it's psychologically painful. Um, and as you said, in terms of take-up, it's a, it's a major deterrent um, to take-up. Those who do take-up carry the scar, if you like, uh, whenever we Whenever they think about themselves, it becomes almost an identity because it's reinforced by those of us who are on the outside. You, you look to, to people who are receiving benefit and ask ourselves why and, and come up with an answer like laziness or uh, you know, work shy or, or whatever else. So it, it's a reinforced and very painful and very negative um, emotion that, that people experience. Well, yes, here we have a situation where, as you say, risk has been universalized. Very few people uh, expected a virus, well, no one expected a virus to arrive in December of last year. Uh, and it has, it has hit in very unexpected and strange ways. Clearly, the retail sector has been very dominant. Uh, the spending um, uh, drives our economy, and of course, that has, that has suffered most. But, but the virus has brought with it its own stigma. Um, you can see that right at the beginning here in China, um, where people were called bat eaters, uh, where people whose province was Hubei, who, who had associations with Wuhan, uh, were avoided, were stigmatized. Uh, um, they, they couldn't book transport, they couldn't book hotels. Um, in an international discourse, um, Chinese people abroad have, have suffered direct consequence of the virus being called the China virus or whatever. And when you think about its incidence, which has been so important in underlining the divisions and dis the points of disadvantage in our society, those again feed into the notion that this is a disease uh, that is experienced by people who don't uh, follow socially acceptable behaviour, who don't wash their hands, who happen to live in disadvantaged parts of town. And so there is unfortunately, I think, a stigma associated with the disease itself. 
So in that sense, we haven't necessarily eradicated the notion of stigma more broadly. I think to do that requires real determination from those in charge of shaping, framing, delivering policy to recognize that that, that stigma, that, that, that shame is real. Um, it fulfills a function amongst those of us who aren't poor. It helps us justify where we are in society. We are middle class, why? Because we worked hard. We are not poor, why? Because we did the right things and made the right choices in life. Why don't we give money? Why are we unprepared to pay higher taxes? Well, we don't need to because those people who are receiving benefits don't really deserve it. So it's a reinforcing mechanism it's the opposite of, of the work ethic. Um, the two things things go together. So I think it requires much more fundamental thinking, much more reshaping, and in a sense, of course, universality uh, tackles that head on by, by avoiding making those distinctions. Thanks. That, that opens up at least two directions where I, I would really like to go on a tangent. The first is that what you've just said uh, points to the whole area which philosophers have been very interested in, of what's called moral luck from the title of a, a book by Bernard Williams. In other words, the fact that the social construction of morality is not sufficiently sensitive to the conditions within which people are called upon to be or not to be moral. Uh, if you're lucky in life, then it's much easier to be moral uh, than if you're unlucky. And uh, what you were saying about the social distribution of uh, vulnerability to the to the virus um, points in that direction. And the second thing that um, you made me think of, and I, I'd be interested in your comments on this, it's a it's at the level of ideology rather than is the way in which the anti-confinement, anti-mask uh, movement, particularly in the English-speaking world, has tended to focus on an idea of uh, bodily sovereignty particularly in, on the sort of anarchist far-right uh, branch of that movement, where um, there's actually a duty to be healthy, you know, by taking supplements and exercising and drinking fruit juice and being a good person, such that vulnerability to the virus, particularly through comorbidities uh, related, for example, to non-communicable non -communicable diseases, and in particular, obesity, because of the social stigma attached to it, become a sign of lack of moral fiber, lack of moral virtue. So not only is there a kind of informal, um, unstructured uh, shame attached to disease vulnerability, there's a, there are actually some very strongly structured ideologies very present uh, on social media and in public debate that are making that point as, as a kind of fundamental division between those who take care of themselves and those who don't. I don't know if you have any comments about that, and in particular the extent to which it resonates perhaps in a country like China, outside the um, usual uh, uh, space of circulation of these uh, ideological ideas. Uh, well, pick, picking up on, on both of those points, they, they come together, I think. And shame in, in, in China has got two components, or should we put it the other way around, the opposite of shame, in, in China is often the word integrity. And integrity has two components. It has one which is called Lian and one which is called Mian. Lian is, is about personal virtue. And Mian is about recognized virtue, recognized success. In the, in the pre-marketization period, it was possible to be poor um, and to have high Lian. You didn't have high mian, because you couldn't spend, you couldn't fully participate. But if you made the right choices that you didn't steal, you were a good citizen, you could have lian. And so you had a degree of status while being poor. The market has changed that. Uh, to be rich is glorious. No longer to be poor is to make the sacrifice for the future of China. It's, it's wealth which comes. And so one's integrity uh, comes from the mian component not the Lian component. So to be poor is now to be a social failure. Uh, there is no way that you can have integrity and be poor. You should be rich 
everybody's been given the opportunity to be rich. You're not taking up that opportunity. And there's quite a discourse, quite a policy discourse, which which thinks about, about those, you know, we are celebrating the end of absolute poverty in China this year. And as we've come up to that, there's been much discussion about people who haven't wanted to become rich quickly enough. Um, so that fits into that, those sorts of notions of Nian and Nian. Connecting to the mask, um, your, your um, set of, of thoughts are, are clearly, clearly fascinating. The way I had been thinking about the distinction were, was, was much more around um, the individual versus the collective. Um, so in China, we all wore masks right from the very beginning. Um, maybe we were fearful of what would happen if we didn't, but my feeling is that this was a collective enterprise. In, in China, it's very, you, the concept of the individual is difficult. The closest you get is the family eye. Um, the person separated out apart from that is something which is very, very new in Chinese thinking. So one is naturally doing it for the family, for the neighbourhood, for the community. It's something which is, is part of your social duty. Um, so the notion of, of not wearing a mask, for example, in particular, you know, why should the state tell me what to do? It's, it's I am responsible for my life and my decisions. That is something which is very different in terms of the uh, situation here in China. I think in many Confucian countries as well. And I think, you know, there are rather simple labels that we give to rather complex uh, cultures. But it does seem to me to play out very, very clearly in the way that um, we have responded to the guidance that has come from government. To uh, start the discussion about knowledge and data, which is absolutely central to what we want to do uh, here in UNESCO through the Inclusive Policy Lab, let me perhaps um, start with an anecdote which underlines uh, how important is your emphasis on the, the meanings and multidimensionality of poverty, which comes from the ministerial forum we organized on a virtual basis at the end of uh, September 2020 for the countries of Central Africa. And in doing so, we commissioned a background paper from uh, researchers from the region, uh, asking them to look at the literature and um, uh, data and um, theorizations uh, in contextualized context so that we could understand what the poverty issues uh, are. And what was very interesting in that work is that one might have expected, given the urgency of um, uh, core absolute uh, poverty and hunger among populations in that part of the world, particularly um, populations in countries affected by civil conflict, such as the Democratic Republic of Congo, one might have expected a narrow focus on incomes and survival. And it's interesting that what came from um, the specialists in the region itself was, on the contrary, a strongly multidimensional approach to poverty, emphasizing the importance of the subjective meanings of poverty, even for people in situations of um, extreme personal distress and vulnerability. And if that's true in those situations, then it almost by definition is true everywhere. Um, poverty, as you said, is um, a structure of meanings and not just a set of numbers. And in that respect, what kinds of knowledge gaps you would regard as the most important to make progress in this area? Um, what emerging ideas and research do you find particularly important? And what do you think policymakers should be looking at in order to understand these issues and not fall into the trap of reducing everything to a rather crude one-dimensional set of numbers. Your experience echoes the work from ATD for the world and your observation that if it applies in one, it's likely to apply elsewhere. The, the countries that ATD for the world worked with embraced the United States, United Kingdom, France, Tanzania, Bangladesh, and Bolivia. And they sought to ask the question, indeed, what are those dimensions? As I indicated, there were 
there were nine. Um, uh, there were three which are very familiar to you and I, which was about lack of adequate and secure income. There was another dimension which related very much to decent work. And, and there were a set of um, relationships, set of, set of a, a dimension which, which reflected material innovation, but in, in some cases was responding to the things that are, uh, are personal in somebody's life, that, that has the home. But also uh, talked about social infrastructures in terms of health and educational provision. So those, those combination of things. And that echoes the multidimensional poverty index that they're used to. But they, they, they recognised in, in that there was also institutional abuse, the way institutions respond to individuals. There was social abuse, the way others respond to each other. And, and that was a particularly painful uh, dimension in many settings, particularly in collective, collective settings where the family is traditionally so important and as somebody who are poor, you are excluded from the family network, you're not invited to weddings and to ceremonies because the expectation is that you can't bring a present and if you come, you're asked for a loan. But there was also this notion there of the unrecognised contribution that people in poverty are invisible. Um, that they are often good citizens, well, almost invariably, as most, most individuals are, uh, they, they're good citizens. They, they try to be good parents, good neighbours and, and, and good friends. They also contribute very often with their hands in terms of the production. And the products that they produce on low wages, of course, support the, the much more, um, um, the much higher living standards of those in the middle class. And at the core of poverty was suffering, um, real physical and real mental suffering, mental suffering. I imagine a, a mother who is looking at their child who, who they can't, can't afford to feed or within an urban setting where the mother uh, is, is talking to the child and the child wants something and the mother can't afford to say yes to the child's request and the child refuses to say no for an answer and that suffering turns into, into anger and into violence and into mutual humiliation. But that's not saying obviously that people in poverty are are, are eroded of their agency. They survive, as they struggle and are successful in terms of survival. But they feel disempowered. They feel that they cannot control their lives, that their lives are controlled by others, be it the employer, be it the social worker, be it the agency. And what that work on ATD Fourth World looked at was, was whether those dimensions um, exists across those different settings. And their argument was that they, they brought representatives of the research teams from those countries. And those research teams were in most cases comprised half of people who were experiencing poverty at the moment, according to, to their, their national criteria. And they negotiated and talked to each other. And they argue that those nine dimensions apply in both the global north and in the global south. So we have a discourse, a possibility of a discourse, which binds us together in a, a much more effective way, I think, um, than the traditional ways where we're focused very much on income and, and material deprivation, and we can't use the same scales because of different levels of development. Here, it would appear that we have the potential for measures that would work and engage us in a discussion which embraces embraces the north and south, um, but I think you know that was one. It was a six-country study. It was done very well, but to what extent are those dimensions more generalizable? We've done a little study in 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 China, which sort of replicates that and comes up with very similar dimensions, not precisely the same. The concept of of powerlessness in, in China. Um, well, in a sense, the, the concept of in, in the other countries was more disempowerment. It was about they looked at others 
and, and recognised that they couldn't do what others could do. And in China, it was really about powerlessness, not disempowerment. So that was a, a, a subtle minor difference. In, in, in terms of institutional abuse in China, the state was less, less often uh, the object that was doing the abuse, or at least was reported to. But there was a very much a focus on the employment and the employer in that sort of category. But if those dimensions really are real, then should we not be um, taking those forward, um, using them as criteria against which we could think about the structure, the, the, well, the thinking about, if you like, the framing of our policies and the structure and the delivery of policies to the extent to which uh, we are responding to each of, of those nine, nine dimensions. I think that's really important work to engage with. Uh, to think about and to recognise that that was taking directly into the research process the, the voices of people who were bringing direct up to the moment experience about what they feel it's it's like to be poor. Thanks. I think those are really important and valuable points because they they go in both directions, which is exactly what we're trying to promote in our UNESCO programmes in the social and human sciences. That both a framing of how uh, policymakers need to be sensitized and the framing of what um, knowledge communities in the broad sense, researchers and others uh, producing relevant knowledge um, need to be looking at how they need to frame their work in order to make it relevant uh, to the kinds of uh, discussions that need to take place in contextualized manner, of course, uh, but recognizing that there are also many commonalities um, across national contexts. Robert Walker, it was a great pleasure to talk to you, and I'm sure this podcast will be a great interest to uh, the audience of the Inclusive Policy Lab all around the world. Thank you very much. Thank you for taking your time. Much appreciated.